Well, hey there, everyone. My name's Jess. Welcome to Oak Hill at Home, and thanks so much for being here. Today, we'll have an opportunity to worship together, and then we'll hear a message from Pastor Stephen on our current Go series on the Great Commission. The world and life is in flux, so it's important to stay connected with us throughout the week online at oakhillbaptist.org and on Facebook and Instagram. If you're new with us today, we're so glad to have you here. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service. And we want you to know that there's a place that's perfect for you at Oak Hill. One of the best ways to get connected currently is to message the church Facebook or email office at oakhillbaptist.org. We're here for you. All right, well, good morning, Oak Hill. We are so excited to worship with you. Um, it is an honor and a blessing to worship from all over. Um, I pray this morning that you would worship in spirit and in truth. Um, because we know that our God is in control, he is good. Will you raise a hallelujah with us this morning, despite our circumstances? Let's worship him. Let's praise him.
continue in worship with us this morning. Know that he is lifted high and he is glorified. He's worthy of our praise.
Father, we rejoice in that truth this morning, that you have defeated sin, death, and the grave, that we could look to you because you're consistent and you are good. God, I pray that you would teach our hearts to rest in you. Lord, there is nothing that this world can offer, offer Lord, of safety, of, of anything that is lasting. Lord, but you are good, and we could trust you. We love you. Help our hearts this morning to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. Pastor Raymond here. I hope all of you are staying safe during this crazy time of uncertainty. It has been a little, well, challenging in the Carrillo household to say the least, but I think Joy and I are starting to adjust to this temporary normal. Today we're going to worship with not just our mouths, but with our giving. Just this past week during our kids' worship service, we walked through the story of Jesus and the poor widow. As Jesus was observing all who were walking in and out of the temple dropping off their tithes, he noticed two things. He noticed many rich people putting in large sums of coins, and he noticed a poor little widow who just put in two coins. Then Jesus goes, he pulls his disciples aside, and he says this, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contribute out of, the, out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Jesus did some crazy math here. He essentially said that the widow put in more coins than the rich people, even though she really put in far less. Confusing, right? Well, the point Jesus was trying to make is that the poor widow gave even when it meant giving all she had. And Jesus, who sees the intentions of our hearts, he recognized this. See, it's not the physical amount that you give, but it's the heart of giving that matters most. That is where this act of worship begins. I know right now, some, if, if not all of us, are dealing with a little bit of anxiety, wondering how this virus is gonna affect our finances, if it hasn't already. We may feel like right now isn't the time to be giving, because we may not have much, but I'm here to tell you that this is the right time to give. This is the time for all of us to give big with a cheerful heart, trusting that God is gonna meet our every needs. The amount is gonna look different for all of us, but I'll tell you what should look the same, our hearts. There are not offering baskets that will pass you by on your couch, but there are a few ways to give. 
You can give by texting the amount you wish to give at the number on your screen, or you can also visit oakhillbaptist.org backslash give. If electronic giving isn't for you, you can always stop by or mail your tithe to the church office. We believe God is going to do major things through this trying time. So let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for the example that you gave us with the poor widow. Father, I pray that that right now our, our hearts would be set on you and that as we give, we would give generously with cheerful, cheerful hearts. Lord, I just pray for everybody who is at home right now that is just dealing with any anxiety over, over finances or how this virus is gonna affect them, Lord. I ask right now in Jesus' name that you would give them peace. Father, we just thank you that you are a good father and that you are sovereign and that you have a plan for all of us. We thank you so much for your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church family. I am so excited to be in your homes once again. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 28. This is week three and the last week in our Go series as we look at the great commission, the command of Jesus, and the expectation for all believers. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Let's pray together and then we will get started. Father, we love you, and I thank you so much for Oak Hill Church. And while we are not in the building right now, the church has left the building, we know that, Father, this place is not the church. This is just where the church regularly meets. But we are the church. We are the body of Christ, whether we are a single and alone at home watching this, or we are gathered with our family, knowing that we are connected by the blood of Jesus, and we are connected as brothers and sisters in Christ, that our, our Father, our Heavenly Father, has forever tied our hearts together. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross and sending your Son. And so, Father, would you speak through your word, would you radiate truth, and would you change us from the inside out? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in praying what I just prayed and God changing us from the inside out, we live in a culture that thinks that we should be changed from the outside in, and you and I have probably perfected our outside. Well, maybe not visually, but we know how to play the games. We know the right places to go, what to wear, and the right occasions, the right conversations to have, and we have these segmentations of our life that allows us to paint a picture that everything on the inside matches everything on the outside when genuinely there's a storm inside of our hearts. Our life is falling apart, whether it's through jobs or financial issues, relational problems, maybe even just inner struggles that we're having that we need to seek outside help and biblical counseling. We have this exterior that tells, a, that's like a, an award show. You're only going to see the best of somebody. And so it's why it's important that we submit ourselves that God would change us from the inside out instead of the world affecting us from the outside in. So let's read Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20 together. Now the 11 disciples went from Galilee up to the mountain in which Jesus had directed them. And when he saw him, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey and observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
And so over the last couple of weeks, as we've taken time to stop and look at what this passage is saying to us, and, and by the way, we could spend forever just digging into the depths and the truth and the expectation and the opportunity and responsibility that we read about in this passage. But we've looked at a series called Go. And what does God expect of us, from us, and for us as it relates to the Great Commission? We talked about the authority of Jesus, that if Jesus is in authority and we are subject to Jesus, then we are subjective to, or subject to his authority in our life. So whatever Jesus asks of us, whatever God's word asks of us, you and I should be willing, since he has all authority, to follow him in that process. And so I want to talk today about the call to follow Jesus and what does it mean. As these disciples are hearing Jesus share this, this wisdom, this knowledge, this really this commissioning uh, of their lives, what, what's going through their minds? Because it is a call not just to the disciples that followed him then, but for those of us that are disciples of Jesus now, that we are followers of Christ becoming small Jesuses. And so the word Christian actually means little Christ, and it was meant in the early days as a derogatory term. You and I wear it as a badge of honor. We're not ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1.16 calls us to live that way, but to be a little Christian, a little Christ, an imitator of Jesus. I want to point out a couple of things in this passage as we jump into it today. The first thing we see is that the call to follow Jesus is costly. It, it, it costs. It, it, it literally is you and I deciding that we are going to forego everything that we want in our life, everything that the flesh is calling us to, and it costs us the desires of our flesh to follow Jesus. So think about it. And one of the questions that will be in your follow-up today is, what does it cost you? And what does it cost Jesus? I heard a preacher say when I was a teenager that the call to follow Jesus cost us everything because that's exactly what it cost him on the cross. And so if we're going to follow Jesus, you and I, it's the call is to walk away from everything that the world has for us. It's the ex great exchange, that which is temporal, for that which is the eternal, that which seems tangible to that which will be uh, unprecedented and, and beautiful and eternal in nature. If we're going to follow Jesus, that call to follow him costs us. For some of us, it costs us our plans. I, I know that when I was younger, I didn't think that I'd be in ministry. I didn't think I'd be a pastor. I didn't even think I'd be a Christian. My goal, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you before, but my goal is I, I, I wanted to be in law enforcement. I thought I'd be in some type of investigator, maybe GBI or something like that. I just, I, I've always had an affinity for the law and the process of law enforcement. I've got several friends that are cops. I've done ride-alongs with the Georgia State Patrol, and it's always enjoyable to me. It's uh, just that, that thrill and that rush and the idea of helping people and trying to restore order now that I think about it, ministry is a lot like that. Pastoring a church and pastoring a people is a lot like that. And so if we're going to follow Jesus and submit ourselves to him, we have to understand that it's going to be costly. These disciples, you have to wonder what they thought when Jesus was crucified, when Jesus was buried, when three days later he rose from the dead and when he appeared to them. And he began to give them marching orders. Before the burial of Jesus, it was come to me, come to me, come to me. But after Jesus is sending them, he's not just inviting them anymore. He, he's, he's commissioning them. He's sending them. He's telling them to go. And so even for first century disciples, followers of Jesus, that call is quite costly. We also see in this passage that a call to follow Jesus is confrontational. Scripture tells us that we are to be salt and light. I know some Christians that have a lot of light and no salt. I know some Christians that have a lot of salt and no light. 
And those two words, if you're unfamiliar with the teachings of the Bible and what I mean by that, because even those two words can be considered kind of Bible Christianese, the language that we speak, but maybe the people around us don't really fully understand. To be salt is to me, it's to have truth. So we're heavy in truth. And when I say confrontational, I don't mean that in a negative way. That, that word has kind of negative undertones and, and, and aspects of, it just reeks of strength and like the bull in the china shop type mentality. That's not what I mean. But if you and I are going to walk with Jesus and call people to, to repent of their sins and to love Jesus, that call is confrontational. Because we're then telling them that, this is the cost for following Jesus. Jesus said that to the, the rich young ruler. He, he said, listen, you, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything and then come and follow me. And people want to point out that Jesus was concerned with money. It wasn't about money. It's just that money had gripped that man's heart so tightly that he was unwilling to do that. And that's true for most people in the world, that something grips us so much and we're gripping onto something that we love, we enjoy, we feel like we have to have, that we're unwilling to let loose of that and to grab onto Jesus. But if we are going to walk with Jesus, we're going to live lives that are confrontational. Jesus even told us to expect that. He said, the world hates you. Take heart. It hated me first. And so for Christ followers, for disciples of Jesus, following him lends itself to us swimming upstream, literally going against the flow. And he knew that he was sending the disciples out to scatter. They wouldn't just be uh, there together anymore. That They were going to go to the uttermost parts of the world. We read about that in Acts 1.8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, and the other parts of the world. Literally, as we go, wherever we are, we are to represent the word and the person of Jesus Christ. That The call to follow Jesus is confrontational. We, we see also that the call to follow Jesus is convicting. Do you, you remember where you were when you heard the gospel and conviction began to set in on you? Do you remember that feeling? I do. I, I love sitting under Bible teaching now. And most Sundays, I, I'm doing this, which I love. But occasionally, I get to go to a conference or I, I listen to a podcast or I'll listen to some other pastor preach. And, and what they're sharing is so convicting to me because the Holy Spirit is using that to shape me and to form me and mold me more into the image of Christ. And that's what the Word of God is meant to do. And it's the job of the Holy Spirit to do that. It's not my job to convict you. It's not your Sunday school teacher's to, job to convict you. It's not even your mom's job. As much as she may try to apply the pressure and beg you to come to church and tell you how much of a better life you'd have and how much of a better man you'd be if you just come to church, it's not even her job to convict you. It is the job of the Holy Spirit. And when God begins to speak to us, our only responsibility is to respond. And so I want to couple, talk about a couple of things here in this passage. Four quick things is that we are to share the word. You and I are to share the word. Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe. God calls us to share the word. You and I can't share the word if we don't know the word. We can't know the word if we don't read the word, if we don't sit under the teaching of the word. See, it's good to sit under the teaching of God's word right now in your kitchen, your bedroom, your living room, wherever you're gathered, listening to this with your Bibles open. Hopefully you have sang, we've prayed together, we know what's happening in our church, we're praying about what's happening in our community, country, and world. It's good that you're sitting under the teaching of God's Word. But it's also important that you read God's Word. And sometimes what I'll do is I won't just read God's Word um, silently in my head. I'll read it out loud because I want my eyes to see it and I want my ears to hear it. It's two touches. That's not a magical formula. It's just something that I do. It's a discipline that I appreciate and have just come to love and really enjoy when I'm reading God's Word. But we're to share God's Word, and the only way we can share it is for us to know it. Not only are we to share the Word, 
We're to show the word. A lot of people are good at walking the walk, but not really talking the talk. Some people are good at talking the talk and not really walking the walk. We've all heard that thing, do as I say, not as I do. That's not a good explanation of what Scripture calls us to do. Maybe that saying, rather, for the Christ follower, for the disciple of Jesus, the follower of Christ, someone that's dedicated to him, should say, do as I do and and say as I say. What if we were people who not only talked the word, but we walked the word? You see, the, the world needs Christians to show the word of God active in our life. And there's never been a better time than right here, right now. And we would share the word that we would show the word. He also calls us to teach the word. He says, go into all nations, make disciples. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. All. Teach the nations. Go into all the world. Teach them the word of God. Parents, are you and I as as parents, caretakers of our children, are we teaching them God's word? Because I'll tell you, the primary responsibility for God's word being taught in your children's lives is not Pastor Raymond's. The primary responsibility for the teaching of God's word in your student's life is not Pastor Trent. The primary responsibility for the teaching uh, of word is not even just me. It is for you and I to teach the word of God. And we can't teach it if we don't know it. We can't teach it if we don't share it, if we don't show it. God calls us to teach the word of God. I love sitting under gifted Bible teachers. Excuse me. I love sitting under gifted Bible teachers and hearing them uh, just kind of pull nuggets of truth out that that I've read the passage before that they're teaching and I've never seen before. That's so, so beautiful to me and it's so convicting to me and I love how the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us as we study God's word in different ways to just pull out all of this beautiful truth that God calls us to apply to our lives. We also see that we are to serve the world, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. I've said in this series, people will believe oftentimes what you say, but they will always believe what you do. I'm so grateful for a church that has unbelievable generosity. I'm grateful for a church that sees the mission of God locally, globally, and in, in all around our country. Um, because you give, um, many of you don't know this, but um, because you give, we this week have been able to go to some smaller churches in our area and give a gift to their church from our church because they're having difficulties paying their light bills, because they're having difficulties paying their pastor, because they're having difficulties paying for the things that they need to pay for just to keep operations going. Some churches don't have reserve funds like we do. And no church has a bottomless reserve fund, but because you've given, we've been able to help some some local people that need that are out of work. People with groceries, people with health needs, churches even. And so I would encourage you to continue to give. Um, but uh, if you're one of those that's being affected, loss of a job, loss of wages. I want you to reach out to us. As a church, we love you. And the body of Christ is here for you and should be here for you. But the world, we get to serve the world. And so as you give, we we give to missions. And and we give to things that are going to go and live way beyond us. But the word of God calls us to share the word, to show the word, to teach the word, and to serve the world. And then lastly, the call to follow Jesus is clear. It doesn't seem like it is, and I think because we've tried to overcomplicate it. But the call to follow Jesus is clear. Do you know that you were made on purpose? That you were not an accident? That God, with great intentionality, thought you up? You were God's idea. 
He made you for himself. He made you to know him and for you to make him known. Maybe you're watching this today and you don't know Christ. Maybe you're watching, you've joined in from around the world, maybe right here in in Williamson and Griffin, Georgia. Maybe you're watching this today and you feel far from God. And you feel like there's a lot going on in our life and in our world right now that seemingly doesn't make sense and honestly, it's out of our control. I wanna share something with you that helps me uh, make sense of life especially at times like this when life doesn't make sense. You see, when we read God's word, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God had a perfect design. His design was for himself to know man and for man to know him. And we read about that in the Genesis account of creation that man was made with no sin and Adam and Eve were there and they were given one rule. And any time we deviate, we choose to go against God's design for our life, there's a word for that in the Bible, and that word is sin. And sin is in my life, it's in your life, and we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is what Romans 3.23 tells us. And when we are in sin, we fall into a place of brokenness. Our world has never been more evidently broken than it is right now. There's racism, there's political turmoil, there's wars, there's famines, and now we have this disease that seems to be more and more rampant every day. We open up social media, our smartphones, we watch the news and we see brokenness. But you see, brokenness doesn't just exist in the world. There's brokenness in my life too. And what we do is when we find ourselves in brokenness, we try to work our way out of it. Maybe by getting a better job and making more money. Maybe by some type of dependency on some type of substance or it's alcohol or drugs. Maybe it's in some type of relationship or if we can work hard and, and get more stuff to make us temporarily happy. And all of these pursuits actually don't fix it. They don't fill in the gaps. It takes us to places of deeper and deeper brokenness. But God had a remedy, and his remedy is our third circle, and his remedy is Jesus. You see, Jesus is God's only son, and the Father sent him to die on the cross, sent him down from a perfect heaven to die on a cross, live a sinless life, and on the third day be raised from the dead. And see, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he came so that we would have life and have it abundantly. But we find ourselves here in brokenness. And so the only way that we can get from our brokenness to who Jesus is, is to repent and believe. Repentance is a Bible word. And it's literally not just saying I'm sorry, but it's a confession with our mouth. We we tell God what we've done wrong and we ask him to forgive us. We ask him for his salvation. We ask him to to make us white, like Psalm 51 when David is calling out to God for the, the, the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. That when we repent of our sins, that Jesus takes our sins and he nails them to the cross. That we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he and he alone can do that. And when we do that, it allows us to recover and pursue God's design for our life once again. This is one of the most beautiful parts of of the whole presentation because of all the brokenness that has happened in my life, some of it I'm not responsible for, but most of it I am of all the sin and all the struggles and all the strife and the problems that that I've encountered and that I have grappled with and held on to, Jesus doesn't call me to go and make it all right. You see, Jesus makes it all right again on the cross. And so that's why we can recover God's design from where we are right here, right now. That's why we can pursue God's design from where we are right here, right now. It doesn't mean that I don't have struggles. It doesn't mean that I don't have um, the residual effects 
and the consequences of my brokenness and my sinful decisions. But what it does mean is that I can't clean myself up good enough to be made right. There's not enough money I can give to charitable causes or churches. There's not enough clothing I can give to people who need it. There's not enough mission trips or good deeds I can do to try to earn and win the unmerited favor of God. It comes down to you and I repenting of our sins, believing in Jesus, and recovering and pursue God's design for our life once again. And so that's the culmination of the Great Commission. That as we go, that we would present Jesus as he is. That we would baptize that we would teach, that we would show, that we would share, that we would uh, exhibit Jesus, put on, on full exhibit all that Jesus is for the world to see. And so if you know that you need to trust Christ, on our website today, on the front page, there's going to be a tab called Next Steps. It's going to be on our Facebook feed, our Vimeo feed, at the bottom of the screen, And I would encourage you, if you're a member, a guest, or someone around the world, if you know that you need a relationship with Christ, that you would click that and indicate what you've done. Maybe you need to trust Christ today. In a moment, I'm going to lead you through a time of prayer for that. Maybe there's another decision you need to make in your relationship with Christ, or you'd like to speak with a pastor. Wherever you are in the world, know that when we get this information, we will follow up with you. It's private. Even though it's on our website, it's not going to be posted to our website. This is just for our our staff, our pastor team, so that we can know how to come alongside you. So Romans 3.23 says, Of all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8 says this. This is beautiful. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It doesn't say you could be saved. The Bible says you will. It's a confession and a belief. And so if you need to trust Christ, I'm going to ask you to pray something similar like this. There's no magical words in the prayer, and I only want you to pray it if you absolutely mean it. Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that you're the Savior. I confess my sins to you, and I'm asking you to forgive me for all the wrong that I've done. Make me right with you. Make me whole. Save me. Be my Lord. I pray that you would help me to live for you. I believe that you are the one true God. I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I choose to accept you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that, I'm going to ask that you would visit our website that you would click that next steps. Just give us your name, maybe a cell phone number, an email address, and let us know that you trusted Jesus Christ today. Maybe you decided to make Jesus, you, you decided to just rededicate your life to Christ. Let us know that. Maybe there's another decision that you've been wrestling with. Let us know there's a place there for that. You need to be baptized. Just send that in to us and let us work with you, know that we're praying for you, that we love you, and and no matter what's going on, I want you to be encouraged. God is still in control. So love God, love people, and at home, be the church. Thank you again for joining us this week. We just heard from Pastor Stephen on the cost of following Jesus. So this week, be thinking of why it's so costly to follow Jesus and how we can show Jesus to the world in this new climate. We charge you with sharing Jesus with someone this week. We saw Pastor Stephen walk us through three circles and how simple it is to incorporate it in our daily lives. 
As always, stay connected with us throughout the week online at oakhillbaptist.org and on Facebook and Instagram. And thanks for being here with us this weekend.